Uh, I was actually in, originally invited here um, by Elliot, who very graciously said that you guys might be interested in hearing a little bit about uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is a project that I have been working on um, literally since straight out of college for almost 15 years now, which is bringing California condor home to Yurok ancestral territory. And so I think as it mentioned in the intro, I am a Yurok tribal member. Um, I was born in this area. My family comes from the village of Wehikwel, which is right on the south side of the mouth of the Klamath River up here, very far northern California. Um, one of our ceremonial sites and being Yurok is very foundational to who I am. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of more introduction of who we are as Yurok tribal people. Um, who Condor is, why they're so important to us, and some of the things that we have been doing for the last 15 years uh, to bring them home, um, having been local, locally extinct for about 130 years now. Uh, Francine, if I could have the next page, please. Okay, so this is us. We are, as I, as I mentioned, located in very far northern California, somewhat amusingly enough, if I tell someone not from the area that I'm from northern California, they say San Francisco. And I'm like, no, actually, we're about a seven hours drive north of San Francisco. You can't really get much farther north than us, just south of the Oregon border. Our reservation is this kind of orange line that you see around what's the Klamath River, and it's one mile on either side of the Klamath River and 44 river miles up the river. The red boundary um, that you see around it, the large one, is actually our ancestral territory. And so our reservation is only about 10% of our ancestral territory. And the reservation, um, it's its just kind of a, a, a political boundary in the same way that California is a political boundary. It's where the tribe has jurisdictional authority over how the lands are managed, but it's not necessarily owned by the tribe, like a lot of it is actually owned by Redwood National Park, a lot of it is actually owned by timber companies, and most of the lands outside of our reservation are owned either by the Forest Service or the parks or timber companies in this area. But so we still maintain this really strong obligation to the whole of our ancestral territory, even though a lot of it's kind of out of our direct management these days. So partnerships have been a really big deal when it comes to restoring all of your ancestral territory. And for condors in particular, uh, Redwood National and State Parks has been a really powerful partner. So they're kind of the more khaki green that you see towards the left um, along the coast. And they overlap quite heavily, both with uh, Yurok ancestral territory and then with um, and then with our reservation as well. So this is actually a joint project that we call the Northern California Condor Restoration Program um, with Yurok tribe and the parks uh, hand in hand the whole way. Next slide, please. So a little bit of an introduction to the bird. Um, many of you may be quite familiar with this guy, but he's super cool. Uh, this is the California condor or the Preganish in the Yurok language. He's actually the largest land-based bird in North America with a wingspan of nine to nine and a half feet. And he's a, he's a giant obligate scavenger. So basically he's a giant vulture. He can weigh as much as 25 pounds and his lifespan we expect to be about 60 plus years. They're so long lived, we haven't actually been studying them long enough to um, really know how long they can live. But currently the oldest condor is 55 years old, and we know that their near cousin, the Andean condor, can live as much as 80 years, at least in captivity. Next slide, please. They've got a lot of interesting characteristics to them. They're actually monomorphic, so you can't tell the male from the female, uh, at least not without a genetic test, uh, not even necessarily by behavior, because just like humans, some behave in ways that maybe wouldn't be quite as binary as you might expect. Um, but so one of the first things that are done with chicks when they get into hand or juveniles is to do a genetic test to uh, sex it, but then also to make sure that the parents are who you think they are, because Again, like humans, uh, mom and dad aren't always who you expect them to be when it's mom and dad, even though they do form lifelong mate bonds. And so um, 
regardless if there's some extra mate bond activity and things like that, both of the parents um, who have formed the life, the lifelong mate bonding um, really focus on being good parents. So both contribute to the brooding of the egg. Um, once the egg hatches after about 56 to 58 days, um, they both uh, contribute equally to keeping the chick warm and to bringing food back to the nest. That chick doesn't fledge till six to seven months, which is quite old for a bird, and it won't actually reach full maturity until about six to eight years. Now, all of this information is really important because condors are highly endangered, and they have chosen kind of the case-selected reproductive strategy where they live a long time, but only have one egg every other year. So very slow reproduction that they just put a lot of care into. But of course, when you have a high mortality rate, which they're currently suffering under, and a low reproduction rate, that equals endangered status. If I could have the next slide, please. So why they're so important to the Yurok people, and in fact, all the tribes in this area, relates to this idea of being world renewal or fix the earth people. And so this is a piece of art by our local artist, Lynn Risling, who's actually cut a Yurok and Hoopa descent. And it shows what we call our high dances, our white deerskin dance and our jump dance or our lifting up dance. And these are ceremonies that regionally we hold um, the Yurok tribe holds every two years, the Hoopa tribe holds every other year compared to us, so that somebody's dancing this dance every year. And we all dance in each other's dances, even though we have different territories and we actually speak different languages and all these sort of things. This world renewal ethic is something that is very foundational to all the tribal people in this area. And Condor features heavily in world renewal, um, in the ceremony and in our concept of who we are as people. Could I have the next slide, please? So in your belief in particular, Condor is one of the highest of animals, spiritually speaking, but he's also kind of physically and ecologically speaking, the highest of animals in the sense that as our former councilman and cultural leader, Richard Myers put it, uh, it can soar the highest. So we figured that was the one to get our prayers to heaven when we are asking for the world to be in balance. We believe as tribal people that in the beginning of time, it was actually these creatures, um, the spirits of the world uh, who are really the people of the world even before humans were and it was at that time that they were designing these ceremonies and it was at that time that condor gave us his song um, which we use as a prayer in our high ceremonies and um an interesting component of the story at least to me that uh, condor did not want to sing Condor actually doesn't have a voice box he mostly um, communicates in hisses and grunts um and just didn't really think well of himself like he wasn't very handsome he didn't have a good singing voice which is an important important Yurok beauty sort of thing but uh, the creator who wanted the song for this ceremony said no i want to hear your song condor you fly the highest you've seen the whole world but more important he knew that condor had a very kind heart so we consider that to be kind of foundational to who he is and so sure enough, he sang this song and it was really like hisses and grunts, but the creator heard the truth of the song. He heard the heart of it that he gave and he said, oh, that's, the, that's beautiful, let me sing it back to you. And sure enough, when creator sang back the spirit of it, it was the most beautiful, the most powerful song that had ever been heard. And a lot of the messaging behind it is about being kind hearted, about being generous, about reciprocally taking care of each other, which is a lot of what our world renewal is about. But beyond that, he provides his feathers and we believe through them his spirit to the dances and many Yurok families like my own teach that he's never to be harmed and any feathers that we receive that we use in our regalia are considered to be gifts. So for all of these reasons and more that our tribal park task force, which was a panel of our elders uh, specifically designated to identify cultural and natural resource restoration needs, chose Preganish, which is the Yurok word for condor, as the highest priority land-based species to return to ancestral territory. Again, he's been gone for 130 years. The next slide, please. <clears throat> So historically, they've actually done really well. Um, this is just a snapshot of recent history, but 
Back in the Pleistocene epoch, which ended about 20,000 years ago, their range went all the way up into what's now British Columbia, down into what's now Baja California, and across what's now the United States and up into New York. But by the 1850s, their range had shrunk to this kind of gray area that you see here. And by the 1950s, their range had shrunk to this little red wishbone that you see here. And next slide, please. And a lot of these mortality factors that were driving their range uh, smaller and smaller and actually ultimately resulted in just 22 individuals le left in the entire world um, were, as you might expect, human related. So particularly after the California gold rush and there was just a huge influx of new people, um, there was like, for example, a major reduction in the megafauna, the large animals that they like to feed on. So the deer and the elk, the bear, whales, California sea lions, which were both put under a lot of pressure because there was abruptly a lot more people, but also because of the introduction of market hunting, which commoditized these sort of creatures instead of um, e existing with them in a relationship. Instead, they became things. Um, there was direct take of the animals, of the birds, uh, both because people loved them and thought they were cool or because they were scared of them because, hey, there's this giant nine and a half foot wingspan of a bird flying over my cattle and my children. But regardless, there was direct take of both the birds and the eggs. They suffered from habitat loss. So in our region, that was the loss of our old growth redwoods. Um, not completely, but in a large proportion of them. They like to use them for nesting. Um, it was also loss of our prairie systems, which local peoples had maintained um, quite expansively uh, for millennia. But like, for example, at this point, are only 1% of what they used to be historically. But that's where they would find a lot of their foods. Uh, there was poisoning. People would lay out poison carcasses for other sort of scavengers or, or carnivores like wolves or bears that they didn't want to see and condors would incidentally eat it. And there's actually two issues that remain a problem for condors today, which is DDT contamination and lead toxicity. And I'm going to talk about both of them a little bit more as they were part of our exploration as to why condors um, or as to whether condors could come home or not. Uh, next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, the decline of the population was really quite abrupt. Um, even that such by the 1939, there was about 150 in the wild, but by 1982, uh, they had dropped to just 22 individuals, making them one of the most significantly endangered birds in the world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and that was a problem for us. Um, I mean, obviously, not just for the tribal people, but for the ecosystem, as well as kind of the cultural narrative that, that our region expresses. So condors are a particularly interesting creature um, in that they're, they're definitely an umbrella species, and that being an apex species, everything that's a problem down below feeds up and, and trickles upward towards them kind of cumulatively. So I always, I always say that if you have a problem for condors, um, you have a problem for the world. But if you have a happy and healthy condor population, you probably have a happy and healthy world. But ecologically, uh, they're a very important species and they are an obligate scavenger. And while we do have scavengers in this region, uh, we still have our turkey vultures, we still have our common ravens. They're all significantly smaller than condors. Um, and so they're unable to really break into those large megafauna, for example, our California sea lions, which otherwise just kind of sit and bloat on the landscape and it takes weeks for the, micro, for the, bio, for the uh, microorganisms to start breaking them down sufficiently to actually get rid of them. And so if any of you are familiar with, for example, the die-offs of vultures in India that was associated with some medicine that was being used, um, I mean, they got plunged into a very bad state because they didn't have scavengers cleaning up their landscape anymore. Um, there was a lot more carcasses that just weren't going anywhere. There was a lot more disease uh, from the carcass directly, um, but also kind of secondarily in that there was a lot more wild dogs now scavenging on these animals, which meant a rise in rabies. Um, and it was just a horrific mess. And it was calculated that their service was worth billions of dollars of human services if we were to be able to if we were to try and do it ourselves. 
And like I said, we weren't that bad off because we do have our existing scavengers, but there's definitely a major niche that was not being filled um, in Condor's absence. So an ecological keystone species is a species that has an inordinate impact, or one of the definitions of it is a species that has an inordinate impact on the region that it's in as compared to its relative size. And so scavengers in general kind of fit that ecological keystone species uh, supplying such an important role. But they're also a cultural keystone species and there's some interesting crossover there. And so a cultural keystone species is a species that um, inordinately impacts the cultural ethnosphere kind of of the region that it lives in. And so for Condor, if you hark back to kind of that foundational reason for being that world renewal ethic that's so um, who we are as tribal people and how important he is to it, he definitely, I would say, drove our cultural narrative. And if he had, if we had not co-evolved with him, we might have very well have been a different people. We certainly would have had a different sort of approach to the world. The interesting kind of crossover between their ecological and cultural um, keystone nature is that they as people influence us as people. So even though there still aren't that many condors in the world, um, we as people have grown to really love them. And so we, they are kind of like, they're still really impacting our culture. And so for us as tribal people, this kind of fits into a, a traditional niche, but for the broader and conservationist community, it fits into the conservation culture and they're driving change to make the world a better place. So they're having an inordinate impact both ecologically because they're impacting us and we're impacting the world in a good way. And culturally, as they kind of stand for the, as this iconic symbol of conservation. But it kind of goes the other way too. Um, like I said, if you've, got a, if you've got an unhealthy condor population, you've probably got an unhealthy world. And so if I could have the next slide. Oh, I don't know if it got stuck. There we go. Um, I see a lot of the things that brought condors down as being a lot of the things that brought travel people down in our area. And then I think they both kind of arose out of this idea that condors and, and native peoples were kind of lesser peoples that things could just be done to, unfortunately. But so a lot of the reduction in megafauna um, impacted us. Those were the foods that we had relied on to be healthy and well, and which we had, had lived with in reciprocal relationships since time immemorial. Um, there's direct human take of the birds. Uh, we suffered from massacres and the theft of our children into the boarding schools and the attempted at genocide of our culture. Habitat loss equates with removal from our home. Poisoning and, and various chemical toxicities, I think, associate with the introduction of new toxic elements like alcohol and disease um, that were introduced to the tribal peoples. So just in general, this sort of time of chaos that came immediately post-contact before people started kind of evolving with the world that they lived in now here, um, it, just, it just caused a lot of destruction and Condor was nearly driven extinct, even as tribal peoples were nearly driven extinct. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? But conversely, Condor is very tied to restoration and hope and renewal as well. So one story that I really love both as a tribal member and as a tribal biologist is that of our, really this is, this is paralleled in both our white deerskin dance and our jump, in, jump dance, but I'll talk about the white deerskin dance because as condors were disappearing from the world, um, almost at exactly the same time around the turn into the 20th century, uh, our white deerskin dance was disappearing from the world um, in large part because of this really bad time that we were going through. Um, it was actually illegal to practice tribal religion. Two of the largest massacres in our region, uh, one which was over 400 people, um, happened during world renewal ceremonies when we were all gathered together. Um, could I have the next slide, please? And so we didn't dance it for decades, for generations. And it wasn't until the early 1990s that one of the eldest of our elders, um, one who had actually danced the white deerskin dance in his youth a very, very long time ago, 
uh, took on the role of a leader in reinstituting the white deerskin dance after many, many years. And so the story as it's told to me was very impactful because I'm being told this story by an elder, someone who I look up to as being wise and knowledgeable. And he's telling this story of this eldest of elders uh, who has since passed on. And the elder I'm talking to says, okay, so the old man, he says, the first thing we're going to start with is the condor song because it's the most important part. And this elder I'm talking to says, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know condor was a part of these ceremonies. And from my perspective, I'm understanding that because condor had been gone so long from our system that we were on the brink of completely losing our relationship with him. If it hadn't been for this eldest of elders, as well as other elders are currently past or still with us, really, it's just a matter of a few years, we might have lost this most foundational reason for who we are, these world renewal ceremonies. And we could have lost that knowledge of the connectivity um, with Condor that we have and with world renewal. And so I always just really like that story. Um, on the one hand, it's a little bit terrifying, but on the other, it's definitely a rise from the ashes sort of story. And I think that as well parallels the story that Condor has had coming to the brink of extinction, but people just refusing to let them go and doing everything that they can. Of course, it's taken hundreds and countless people, hundreds and countless hundreds of people to actually bring Condor back. And in the same way, there's all kinds of restoration work happening in the Yurok world. Um, and I just think that they're really parallel stories, both ecologically and culturally, that we as a people in the United States have grown together in such a way that we can really make restoration of ourselves and of our system happen. I could have the next slide. And so I just like this slide. These dances are healing the world again. Both the white deerskin dance and the jump dance are, are uh, being danced every other year again. And um, personally, as a tribal member, I think that the prayers that we send out during those ceremonies have really helped just restoration in general. For example, the Yurok tribe is one of the leaders in taking out four dams along the Klamath River. It's going to be the largest dam removal project in the United States history, and it's going to open up well over 100 um, spawning miles for salmon. Or we've had these amazing language revitalization um, projects going on, or we've got ceremonies that haven't been danced still and decades are being revitalized. And I think all of this kind of comes back to this, this role as world renewal people um, and this ethic that just refuses to let us quit, you know. Uh, and my alarm's going off here. Okay, if I could have the next slide. So I'm going to step back a little bit, um, that got a little bit heavy, and just briefly run through some of the feasibility work that we did, because we know that condors lived here once, but we also know that they were driven out, and we had to answer the question of, can they come home safely? So some of the major questions that we looked at, and we kind of developed this in coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is, is there available habitat for condors to carry out necessary life history activities, or has it been lost? Um, will marine mammal derived DDT levels limit recovery in Northern California? Will lead limit recovery in Northern California? And I'll say that's tied to the use of lead ammunition. Um, and so therefore, what are the attitudes of Northern California hunters and will they accept non-lead ammunition as a viable alternative? If I could have the next slide, please. So just in brief, um, what we did to look at habitat suitability these days was to kind of uh, take a geospatial approach and look at the various life history needs that the birds have. So roosting, nesting, foraging, flight corridors, and um, kind of define parameters of what looks good for a condor and then look for it. Where do these things exist on tribal lands? And so this is an example of our flight corridor map that we came up with. And condors can fly as much as 100 to 200 miles in a day. So arguably their ability to get from point A to point B is really the defining feature of whether they can make it in an area um, because they can usually find what they need to find if they can just get there and they're very adaptable. So even though habitat loss and food loss probably contributed to their um, 
their historical decline, a lot of the conservation movements of the 20th century have uh, resulted in rebounding food populations. And there was an effort, of course, to save the last of our growth redwoods in our redwood national and state parks and our California state parks. And so those were preserved and not even changes on the level of past gold rush um, could actually change the face of the landscape enough to impact condors. So all in all, it looks like we've still got ample good quality habitat now that the food resources are coming back. If I could have the next slide back, please. The next big question was, will DDT contaminant levels limit recovery in Northern California? Um, could I have the next slide, please? And so many of you are probably familiar that the, the problem with DDT is it causes eggshell thinning, and that is true amongst a whole host of species and still true for condors. We actually banned the use of DDT in the 1970s because we discovered this problem, but it's a persistent organic pollutant, and particularly areas like the Southern California Bight, where just literally thousands upon thousands of barrels were dumped into the Southern California Bight, there's still very high levels of DDT. And so our concern was that, particularly it being a fat binding molecule, California sea lions or other blubbery marine mammals like um, whales of various sorts would actually migrate to these more contaminated areas, bioaccumulate it, and then bring it back to our relatively pristine shores. And so this is an example of a healthy egg. It's actually in Southern California, but the, the birds there don't utilize these marine resources, which is where a lot of the DDT is. And it's got this surface crystalline layer, which adds strength to the egg and also water retention, as compared to an egg managed by the Ventana Wildlife Society near Big Sur, and it's completely lacking that surface crystalline layer uh, due to DDT contamination. And so the good news, bad news is about 50% of their birds um, do struggle with DDT contamination and have failed eggs because of it. They have ways that they can intervene. Um, sometimes they're successful, time, sometimes they're not. But DDT is only going down in the system. And because of they've got 50% of their birds who are surviving and having good eggs, that means that it's only gonna get better from there. They're on the upward trend. But if I could have the next slide, please. The good news for us is there is a very clear downward trend as you head from south to north. So that bar on the south is the Southern California Bight, California sea lions assessed down there and it's way high. DDT is just out, it's through the roof. But as you head northward, even up into Oregon, it just keeps on going down and down and down very quickly. And so we're second from the right, Northern California, and our levels are actually four, time low, four times lower than those in Central California. And while I can't say until they actually start breeding, which won't be for about five years, um, I'm hoping that that fourfold lower levels will mean that we won't have a problem with reproduction in our area. If I could have another slide, please. So the, I'm, I've left the best for last because it's the worst for last. It's actually the number one cause of condor mortality in the wild. Um, and it's lead contamination arising from the use of lead ammunition. It actually accounts for about 50% of known condor mortality death in the wild. So when they recover an animal that's died and they can figure out why it died, 50% of the time it's lead related. And so the way it's getting into the system is through the use of lead ammunition for hunting. Because lead is a very soft metal, it impacts heavily, um, or when it impacts it fragments heavily, literally into hundreds of pieces. Now, humans have a little bit of a di different digestive system than birds do. Uh, the science is mixed as to whether it has a human impact or not, but it very clearly impacts scavenging birds like condors, um, but actually also bald eagles and golden eagles who are just as susceptible, and it's, it's a pretty gnarly death, actually, um, but which have much faster reproduction. So, as, so the individual suffers, but the population still grows. That's not the case for condors because they have such low reproductive rates. But what it does is it causes um, the digestive tract to freeze. And that means that the bird can starve to death or the food just kind of sits there and rots and they can have disease or they just get so weakened that they suffer from predation and die. Um, but a piece as small as the head of a pin is enough to kill a condor without intervention. 
So it's not so much that the game that is shot is the problem, but that this lead contamination gets into the gut piles, which hunters usually leave behind. And without lead contamination is actually really good food for scavengers and is part of the really important role that hunters continue to play in environmental management um, these days, but not when it's studded with lead ammunition, unfortunately. If I could have the next slide, please. So we assessed if this was going to be a problem here by looking at turkey vultures and common ravens, not having condors yet here to actually assess directly. And we found, unfortunately, that about 24% of our turkey vultures did have elevated lead levels at a level that would be a problem for condors. Now, condors are not turkey vultures. It's kind of like apples and peaches. You know, they're similar, but they're definitely not the same animal. But um, particularly if you look at, uh, say, a comparative sample, um, you look at the two, we're the bar on the far left, but if you look at a similar study done in Mendocino County just south of us, you can see a clear elevation of lead levels correlating with the use of lead ammunition during hunting season. So basically they didn't Outside of hunting season, which is the bar in the middle, there's 36% of their birds were contaminated with lead. You look at it inside of hunting season, and 66% um, of their birds were contaminated with lead. So it went up with the use of, or during the time of hunting. Now we couldn't do quite that duplicate study because our birds are actually migrating during hunting season. So our 24% represents birds outside of hunting season. But we did a similar study with ravens who are non-migratory and we saw that same pattern. It was lower outside of hunting season. It was higher inside of hunting season. I could have the next slide, please. So as this was becoming clear, actually pretty, pretty early on in our study, which actually went on for several years and, and covered quite a large geographical area, um, we started our Hunters as Stewards project, initially really focusing on our tribal membership, but very soon expanding to the much broader hunting community, reaching out to what's now a very strong conservation ethic amongst a lot of the hunting community, because these are the people who really like to be out in nature, who want to have that complete and healthy environment to enjoy. And so we brought them the information about how lead was impacting the system, how it fragmented heavily, how it got into the meat, how it got into the environments, and conversely, about what sort of alternatives they had. And so the main alternative to lead ammunition, um, non-lead ammunition, is usually made out of copper. And so copper is that bottom right there. It's a much harder material, and so it doesn't fragment on impact. Um, and it's got kind of a different mechanism for basically doing the same thing, which is knocking an animal down quickly and cleanly, which is what most hunters care most about. And so it was actually developed decades ago not to be an environmentally friendly bullet, but to get the job done but it ends up being an environmentally friendly bullet because um, it doesn't fragment on impact. It stays intact. It can just be pulled right out of the animal. And even if a condor were to eat this, it's not that fine dust. So he could just easily spit it back out and not be harmed by it. And so we did some initial assessments of how our messaging was going. Anywhere from 85 to 95% of the hunters we talked to, depending on the event, said, hey, I had no idea that this was a problem. And of course, I'll make a switch to non-lead ammunition, which was incredibly encouraging, though not terribly surprising, because I know a lot of hunters in our region, and I knew that this would be important to them. Um, it does seem to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, we need to reach as many hunters as we can because there's a lot of misinformation about there about lead versus non-lead or why people want you to switch to non-lead that it's become political unfortunately but once you do have these one-on-one -on -one conversations and invite folks in and, and as partners in conservation in this way um it's i mean just get astounding results if i could have the next slide please and so that was kind of the approach that we took for our entire work um reaching out to people right off the bat to say hey we're hoping to bring condors home we think it's going to be good for the region but i want to know what your concerns are and how do we address them and how do you become a partner with us and so 
We developed a memorandum of understanding first with just five partners, ourselves, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, California State Parks, and actually Ventana Wildlife Society, which manages the clock in coastal central California to say, hey, we think that it's a good idea for condors to come home, not only for condors, but for the region. But as we went out and talked to all of our regional land managers, uh, federal, state, uh, for-profit industry, um, utility companies, nonprofit uh, entities out there, uh, kind of with this message of, of what do you think and how do we how do we bring you in as partner? Um, it was very positively received so that um, within four years, we actually had 16 signatories on this MOU ranging across that full scope federal state industry um, utility and, and nonprofits. And that's kind of been the way that we've been going forward the whole way. And we've had a lot of success and we've got a lot of support in our region now. If I could have the next slide, please. So our, we then spent um, about a total of six years going through the environmental assessment process. It ended up being a very complicated one. There was literally thousands of comments that came in. Um, but ultimately, as of May 23rd of last year, we received a finding of no significant impact, which was kind of that final federal go ahead. Yes, you can release condors up here on the North Coast, which was hugely exciting. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. And so that's exactly what we've been doing for the last year. We have been actually establishing a release and management area within Redwood National Park boundaries where they overlap with uh, Yurok Ancestral Territory boundary. So a place that's sacred to not only the Yurok tribe, but all surrounding tribes having been a major ceremonial site um, or near one and also a major trade and just cultural exchange sort of site. I can have the next slide, please. And so this is actually what we built. Uh, this is our release and management facility. There's three parts to it. The biggest part that you see is the flight pen and it's where we keep birds for uh, when they're, they're in our care, basically. Um, the goal is to get them flying free, but when they first arrive, they are put into the flight pen to kind of acclimate to the area. And then there's two other components. Um, you can kind of see in the background off to the right, there's what's actually an, an old shipping container that we revamped into an observation room. It's got one-way glass where we can watch the birds and make sure that they're healthy and well, but where they can't be disturbed by us. And then there's a double door trap, which is kind of this little square um, at the end near to the right. And it's called a double door trap because it's used to funnel birds in and out. It has doors on both sides of it, both interior to the, the flight pen and exterior to the out outside. And so you put a carcass in there, um, not to be too gore or detailed, but put a carcass in there and you'll open the door from the flight pen to the double door trap and lure a bird in that you want to release and then close the door behind it. And then you'll actually um, pull open the door from the other side to the exterior and let it go. Similarly, if you want to capture a bird from the outside and bring them in for whatever reason, you can use that facility like that. If I could have the next slide, please. So the entire exterior is actually also surrounded by a predator exclusion fence. We have, at last count, nine times more bears up in our region than any place else in California. We also have a healthy um, bobcat and mountain lion population. So it's a 12-foot fence, and it's an electrified fence, which is the best way to keep the bears out and allows a large expanse below the release management facility for birds to be able to land in and be safe because these are birds who are coming from captive rearing programs and are being released at about two to three years of age. And while that is fully flight capable, they have literally never been outdoors before. And so we wanted to provide them a safe space to land in so that they could be monitored and kept safe until they really got their wings under them. Uh, we also uh, established our condor management and operations center, which is that picture in the lower right. It was a terribly dilapidated building that had been slated for demolition, actually, but we received some funding from the Administration for Native Americans and were able to make a really beautiful office space out of it. And it's kind of our jumping off point for all of our field operations. If I could have the next slide, please. So these are our four birds, um, four juvenile birds. We have designated A0 through A3. And so we have four birds and one, four young birds and one adult bird. 
And so the young birds are those with kind of that mottled under white wing and the black heads. And then the, the adult male, uh, mentor bird number 746, is that on the lower right, uh, spreading his wings so beautifully. And so he was brought in to be kind of an elder for the birds, kind of finishing them up and teaching them the last bits of what it meant to be an adult condor. Uh, he unfortunately is not a releasable bird. Uh, he's got very important genetics. Genetics are very important to the overall population health because, um, I mean, they got down to just 22 individuals. So every single bird is monitored for its genetics and its lines. And he's got a very rare genetic line. But still, um, he's just turned eight years old. So he's just really old enough to start contributing and kind of as a last hurrah, um, closer to the outdoors, he came here and uh, started being a mentor for her, for his birds. So he's actually still in the facility and he'll remain in the facility, but so far we've actually released A0, A2, and A3. And A1 is still waiting uh, because he had a faulty transmitter, but hopefully within the next couple of weeks, he will be released. So if I get to have the next slide, please. Oh, this is what I was just talking about, sorry. Those mentor birds are there to teach young condors how to be condors, establish dominance hierarchies. They've got a very strong social structure, um, focus their attention on adult type behaviors, but ultimately as well act as social magnets. So he's gonna stay in there, but all of these young birds recognize him as kind of the boss bird. And so they stick close to home again, while they're really figuring it out and helps us maintain and manage the flock until they can really manage on their own. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll see if this works with our technical difficulties, but uh, now as of May 3rd, Preganish Nesquichash, Condor has returned to Yurok country and is now flying free. We can see if you can click, there's a little video um, that I'm hoping to share and we'll see if it works. I think you can just click the slide in general. I think it should move on to the next one, but yeah. Yeah, I think if you just advance, it should be able to just move forward. Yeah, and the music is just music. It's got um, text down below um, saying what's going on there. But um, I think if you click again, it should start moving. Just click on the screen. Let me try it because I, I didn't set this up for uh, video sharing. So let me let me try to stop the share and start it back up again. And we might get it to work. Okay, it's not super critical. <laughs> it's just a, a picture of the a video of the release itself, which was cool. But um, no, what did I do? I'm sorry, I forgot about that bit when I was uh, doing this. <laughs> That's okay. No, I can't get the, um, hmm. okay. I don't think that's, I don't think it's going to play, but, um, one moment. I'll see if I can find it online. The Iraq tribe did share it. Um, if nothing else, I can drop it as a link into the chat and you guys can watch it. I gotta say, I've never had a, um, a presentation quite so fraught with te technical difficulties. Just by luck. Let's see. I'll try. We're back, but I don't, I don't think we're going to have music or video. Okay. Well, if you can somehow just skip through, I guess I'll try and share it. Um, if there's any questions, I'll look through and try and, and try and share it in the chat. Hopefully you can just flip through. Okay. 
Well, so this is this is a picture of our first bird out. Um, A3 was the first one out the door, and we actually called him Poit Wasan. And Poit Wasan literally means the one who goes out ahead. And it's a reference to our headman who would, you know, literally actually walk um, ahead of most folks. But he was the leader of our villages and helps lead them in how to live in a good way. And so this A3, as the first bird out, was named Poit Wasan. And his name ended up being really valid for him because he just took off and started exploring and didn't come back for three weeks. Um, he had a really great, um, ex great exploration of our area. He learned a lot of really good flying techniques, scared us a little bit because we were hoping he'd stay closer to home for a minute, but we, but he came back on his own. We kept eyes on him in the meantime and um, then was able to share a lot of this with the birds that came after him. I could have the next slide, please. And so this is A2. He was the second bird out. He and A3 have been best buds since the very beginning, which is part of the reason why they're such a good pair. They went out together at the same time. Um, and A2 we named Nesquichok. And Nesquichok means he returns or he arrives. And I had intended that kind of as a, a broader commentary that Condor has returned home in general. But again, the name seems to have stuck and fit for him because he's been very much a home buddy. Um, he takes his flights out. He comes back in. He roosts in the same trees. He eats the food that we leave out um, and is pretty content to just stick close to home. He comes back every day. Um, though now that A3 has returned, he's being a little bit more bold. And he goes, I don't think he's left overnight yet. If I could have the next slide, please. And this is A0. I unfortunately don't have a really good exterior uh, for her yet. Uh, her name is Negep Nechwinka, and that means she carries our prayers. And so that's representative, I think, of the role that Condor plays traditionally. But I also mean it in the sense that she and all of our condors as well as all condors carry our prayers with them in the hopes that they are healthy and well and just blessed in every way as they help reestablish this pop population in northern california basically our prayers go with her and as i mentioned a1 is still with us um, hopefully he has a new transmitter um, um, within the next week and we can release release him the week after that um, and his name will be announced at that point uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Almost wrapped up here. So just in brief, a lot of people are interested in how we're going to do this moving forward. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our condor management strategies, we call them. Next slide, please. So we will be releasing four to six birds per year. Um, birds are usually released in the fall. We release them in the spring um, because there's kind of a similar sort of weather pattern. It's it's not it's not too hot. The winds aren't too great, but there's not too much rain either. We kind of want to strike a balance between it being a little bit nasty, but not too nasty, in the hopes that they will have the opportunities to learn how to be out in the outdoors, but won't you know take advantage of it to just take off. Um, for example, in the summertime, they might do that. But usually they come to us in the fall. So we're actually going to receive our next cohort um, probably in August uh, to be released in late September. And birds are typically received at two to three years of age, as I mentioned, from the captive rearing program. So they've never been out in the wild, but they are old enough to fly. They're allowed to acclimatize in the field release and management facilities for several months, getting used to the winds, the updrafts, the temperatures. Um, everything that they can get to know to feel about our region before we release them. Releases occur as pairs or singly. So originally, so our first bout was A2 and A3, um, and then A0 followed a couple weeks after. And we do that, um, that pairing at first so that they've got a buddy and they can learn from each other and watch out for each other. But you don't want to do more than two at a time because you want to be able to put a lot of focused attention on these brand new birds going out get them up and going before you release the next bird so that you can get the next bird your full attention. Um, we've got the mentor that we brought in from the Peregrine Funds uh, World Center for Birds of Prey. I think he's going to stay with us to our next cohort after that. We're going to actually, these first four birds and then the next birds are going to be our older birds who will be able to teach our younger birds some of these things that this older bird is teaching them now. Uh, next slide, please.
So every bird is incredibly important to us. And so they're all outfitted with transmitters and tags. Uh, they've all got an alphanumeric on them. This is actually a bird from Southern California, I think. Um, but all of our birds start, uh, you should notice A0, A1, A2, A3, and that's so we can visually identify them out in the field. Um, but that ties to their stud book number. Every single bird is in the stud book and it tells where they were born, who their parents were, if they had any offspring, all of that sort of stuff. Because again, the genetics are very important, um, as well as just knowing how these birds fared. Did they do well? Did they, did they die? Um, and what happened to them? Um, so every bird also carries both a satellite tag and a radio uh, transmitter. And so the satellite tag allows us to really assess how they're using the landscape. What sort of resources are they finding? What sort of risks are they encountering? What whose lands are they using? In which case do we need to reach out to that landowner, make sure that they understand the really cool thing that's going on in their landscape? Is there any way that they, they want to help uh, improve their lands for condor management or, or even just to help us out by letting, them, letting us know when their birds are there? Form partnerships, basically. The radio transmitters are for in the field work. And so basically they send out a little, the satellite tells us generally where the bird is, but we send out crews seven days a week to get eyes on the birds so that we know that they're healthy and well. Um, there's also mortality signal on the birds. So if they haven't moved for three days, it lets us know, hey, this bird's not moving. You might want to go check it out. And a lot of times it's just they didn't have a good signal. Sometimes it's they dropped a transmitter. But other times they've been sick or injured or worst case scenario died, in which case they need to be recovered and um, the reason for death figured out. Uh, we're not to that stage yet. We just have our three birds, but that's that's pretty typical for the, the rest of the California Condor Recovery Program. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, we do trap ups twice annually, um, both in the spring and the fall. And so that involves a physical check a transmitter and tag maintenance, and then a blood draw for testing for disease or for lead contamination or anything else. And that's that's using that facility that I showed you before. We bring in the birds uh, through that double door trap and then lay hands on them to make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just the beginning. Um, we have a long-term vision for these birds. One being that the lower human population in the Pacific Northwest may reduce human condor conflict and, and help them to thrive. We're hoping to release about 120 birds over the next 20 years. Um, and that's, of course, going to be added to through natural recruitment through uh, wild breeding. We think of Northern California up here as just kind of the next phase of condor recovery. Uh, representing a gateway throughout the Pacific Northwest and into the Sierra Mountains. This is actually images based off of a um, geospatial model that was done of condor habitat. So it's kind of how we expect them to expand outwards. And ultimately, we are hoping for a world without, with birds that are without tags that we don't have to manage, a world that we have brought back into balance in order to support condors and other species like them. Next slide, please. Um, and really what we're looking for is to refit them back into the ecological niche that they evolved with here, um, with every animal playing its own unique role, including humans, including condors, including everybody that you see here, working seamlessly together to keep our world uh, balanced and healthy. Next slide, and I think we're almost to the end here. Yeah, <laughs> I would just like to close with this picture. This is my daughter. Um, she's just turned four years old, and um, this has kind of been her progression over the last few years. And I like to share this picture because um, it's my honor and my privilege to be rebuilding a world in which she lives in relationship with Condor. She understands what his role is in world renewal and what her role is in world renewal. Um, I did not grow up in relationship with condors. It was actually being brought into this program actually as a, as a low level technician and learning from my elders about why this was important and which led to learning about why world renewal was important, which led to learning about who I really was in a much deeper way than I had before this program. She's gonna have that right off the bat as well as all of your children and all children in the world who learn to love condors. So that's something I'm very excited about. She loves condors. She's always asking for videos of her Praganish. Um, 
yeah, and I'm just happy to have been a part of that. Uh, this last slide here is just my thanks. Um, it says, um, if we can progress to it, it just says Wakla, which means deepest thanks from my heart. If you have any more questions, um, feel free to email me. Um, you can find my email at our website, uh, yurottribe.org wildlife. You can also find our condor cam where you can watch condors as they come into the facility and um, observe their behaviors and how they interact with each other. We also maintain a Facebook page, um, which is called the Northern California Condor Restoration Program, but can be found at that link. And uh, that's where we post most of our updates. So with that, we've just about run into the seven o'clock, um, but I am done. <laughs> if you guys have any time for questions, I'd be glad to take them. Um, I think we, if we volunteers who have questions, we, we do have about five more minutes until our time runs out. And if any of you are interested in staying maybe five minutes over, um, that would also be okay. Um, so I will open up to the floor. Uh, volunteers, do you have any? Well, first, before I open up the questions, thank you so much, Tiana, for being with us tonight, working through the technical difficulties. There was an amazing presentation. <laughs> Um, I learned so much. I am so excited to share the things that I've learned with the people that I know, and I'm sure that our, our volunteers will do the same. Um, I will be you know, forwarding all of that information to the volunteers, um, and this will be available for folks that couldn't make it today. Um, so we did record the presentation. Um, so now I'll open up the floor for any, any questions. It's a long presentation. I don't know how much I leave out. <laughs> well, I have one question for you. Um, I originally chose to become a park ranger, and one of my classmates did a internship in Pentacle National Park, and at part of her internship, she did some condor releasing out there do you guys did the do you work with the agency down here that are doing the releases are there is it all kind of time together type of idea absolutely um so we have had some incredible support from the rest of california recovery and program and so that kind of covers the people who are releasing and managing birds but it also means the geneticists it's building relationships with those folks who help treat the birds when they're injured or ill in the field um, the breeding facilities all of these folks contribute to this very large scale condor recovery and we're just kind of the next step I think it's a big step. I'm really proud of, our, of ourselves but the next step in condor recovery and kind of building off um, all of this amazing work that was done before. So we've done trainings, for example, with all of the existing release facilities, including Pinnacles and Ventana and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Peregrine Fund down in the Arizona, Utah area. for handling and treatments as well with the treatment facilities at the LA Zoo and Santa Barbara and Oakland Zoo. Um, and then also Pinnacles actually does a lot of the non-lead outreach. And so we've done a lot of that work but honestly their guy dan ryan is so on point so he comes up and and helps give us pre give presentations in our regions as well and then of course we try and help them out wherever we can um, for example the next round of birds we've offered to take them from oregon where one of the breeding facilities is at the oregon zoo down to um, another site i'm not sure if they're going to need our help but it's a very sort of family in the condor recovery program and then kind of follow up, how can we get involved with helping here in the Bay? <laughs> well, if you're not already hooked into them, I definitely advise checking out the Ventana Wildlife Society and Pinnacles National Park because they're your closest condor neighbors. Um, condors have come very close to the south end of the Bay. Um, up to the Mount Diablo region and things like that. And they've just got a ton of amazing information and they've got a really great youth outreach program too. So I was really excited to hear about all the youth, all the youth that you work with and just the incredible numbers of, of budding conservationists that you're helping to uh, bring about because that's a really important part of what we do as well. 
Um, of course, we want to reach out to my generation and older generations and the like to be partners in conservation, but we all know that the best and most uh, profound impact is going to be made by our youth. Um, other than that, um, we appreciate people watching our Condor Cam. We get a lot of really great comments because we can't watch it 24-7. And so we get people telling us, oh, this happened or this happened. So if you're interested, that citizen science is a big part of this. Um, and the other Condor Recovery programs have citizen science programs as well. If anybody's a hunter, I would certainly encourage you to switch to non-lead ammunition if you haven't already. It's actually California law, but not everybody is actually really even aware of it yet. Um, even though it's been a law for a couple of years now to use non-lead. Um, but otherwise, if you guys are interested in incorporating um, any sort of Condor curriculum, I can put um, you in touch with some that's already been developed, or I can provide things that are kind of more Yurok specific. Um, I'm always a little bit hesitant to do that because each region has its own strong tribal community. Um, but maybe that's something I could help out with too, is just if if those connections don't yet exist, maybe finding local tribal representatives who might be able to share if they have any history with condors or finding the nearest ones. Other than that, it's always my last plug. Um, we are 100% grant funded. So if anybody is feeling um, the urge to financially support us, you can also go to the Iraq Tribe website um, and hit our donate button on there. And it goes to a PayPal account that comes directly to Condor Recovery or email me directly if you're interested. Um, it costs about five hundred thousand dollars a year to run this project. Um, so yeah, th those are all the ways that people can help, really. And if anybody's interested specifically in pursuing kind of that education component, I'd definitely reach out to me, and we can work something out. Great. Well, thank you once again, Tiana. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you join us this evening. Um, thank you for working through our, our tech issues. Thank you, volunteers, um, for showing up tonight and sticking with us. Um, we really appreciate it, and we hope to see you all again very, very soon.